I'm glad that you're even doing anything. Sometimes we're just doing ourselves. ideas behind the company. Do you get that question? <laughs> See, we're not That's all right. Um, so the first question I'd like to start with is if you could please tell us a bit more about how and why Commonwealth started and what is the driving force and the ideas behind the company. So Commonwealth started about 12 years ago, so we've been going for a very long time. Um, we started off in a very DIY way, so um, we were a group of people living and working in Bristol and um, we met on a big show that was in a big old hospital uh, and it was basically a big show where lots of artists came together to reclaim a space that was empty and to turn it into a kind of crazy theatre world extravaganza for the audience to explore um, and we did that with no money we did that on pure love for making theatre or making art and that's kind of where Commonwealth was born in the kind of um, DIY <laughs> squatting scenes of Bristol and I guess it was a case of being in the right place at the right time you know it felt like the environment we were in really um, allowed for those kind of things to happen the kind of social situation we were in where we could sign on or we could squat buildings to live meant that we could work for free. Um, and I guess when we first start, started up, we didn't really think about um, having careers in the arts or like having a company that was fully funded until we made a show together, um, me and Evie, that was about domestic violence. And we realised that we couldn't really employ our friends anymore to do the, the jobs because we wanted to have uh, five different characters all different ages so we applied to get some funding from the arts council um and it was there that commonwealth's kind of practice really came into play the practice of working very locally working we, we did that show in a street and a house so it was really working with the local community and seeing how you know very local like people who live next door to you where you were performing might come to a show for the very first time um and i guess the easiest way to sum up Commonwealth is kind of in the, it's in our name. Uh, so Commonwealth is in two separate words. So what we have in common, being common as in being poor, uh, common space, commonality, and then wealth, all the things that come, um, all, the, all the treasures that come in our communities, in society, in the way we live, the way we are, in our experience. Um, and we make, we make theatre in found spaces. So from those squatting days, found spaces, um, we collaborate with multidisciplinary artists. We invite people into our process, whoever they are. <laughs> we're really interested in building with a lot, a lot of people. Uh, and we're always making political work. We're a socialist theatre company. So our work is always at the very centre, at the very core of it is people and politics. Thank you so much. That's absolutely fascinating. I'd like to just ask you, like, well, how was the show received in the, in the hospital? That sounds so exciting. Oh, it was wicked. It was it was based on a Brothers Grimm fairy fairy tale. So it was 
you know, we had a, we had a, a story called the Juniper Tree, so it was a really playful kind of um, magical ex- exploration into like creating worlds. And I think for for me, it was like that play was literally all about how do you create a world for the audience to explore, like how do you really inhabit that world? And it was brilliant because um, it just felt very exciting because people, it was like you know a little bit underground, and then we sold out very fast, and then we had to do another rerun. Um, and it was great because people would just come, like artists would just come and be like, oh, I've got an idea. Can I bring in this puppet the day after? And we're like, yeah, come, just bring it, just add to it. So it felt like we were constantly building the show as we went, which is something, to be fair, that we've taken through our work, like, till this day, like, we're really open for that, that to happen. We really enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that sounds that sounds amazing. I wish I was there. That sounds so exciting. Um, had you, as a matter of curiosity, had you been uh, to a site-specific piece of theatre before that you actually even made the piece of work in the hospital? Uh, for me, like I, I studied in a place called Dartington College of Arts, which is a very experimental. It was a very experimental, experimental radical theatre study, like university drama school. Um, so I, I'd, I'd had a whole like. Yeah, a whole term just exploring site specific theatre with an amazing teacher. And I know Evie at the time, just before I met her, she was on a boat traveling across Europe making shows on the boat. And I know she'd done a lot of work previously like that. And it also said it had some time in that and some studying as well. So we both had a, a knowledge of it. But I think the biggest thing is we had a real passion for it. For us, it wasn't about making theatre in theatres. That didn't excite us. Like just the stage didn't excite us. It was the whole kind of what can you get from a building? What else? You know, how else can we make theatre? Incredible. Absolutely amazing. And I think it's something that I think about a lot, actually, this idea of what is the future of theatre, especially maybe in the, not just the European context, but also in uh uh, in the British context of do we, is the future still in the venues or is there more space and room to be actually taking theatre outside of the space? Is theatre defined by a traditional venue? Um, I'd like to move on to my next question for, uh, with, for you, Evie. Um, would you please take us through like a typical kind of like Commonwealth creative process from like the inception of an idea to the realisation of the performance? Yeah. Um, so yeah, usually because we are always a political company, so the inception of the idea is always at the root of it is some kind of political change or a political motivation, but also usually it's come from a person and a conversation or a connection we've had with somebody, whether that's someone in our family or someone on our, you know, like a neighbour, but often it'll be like, we'll be inspired by someone we meet, um, and then we always interview, so we'll always start to interview and like build up a picture of the subject. Um, so we'll talk to lots of different people that are affected or impacted. So like say with I Have Met the Enemy, we talked to lots of different um, people that have kind of had a relationship to the British arms trade, which might be through war or colonisation or it might be that they've held and fought with arms or it might be that they sell arms so we went to like an arms fair as research so we we do a lot of kind of gathering of interviews and research we then work kind of creatively with a team and just very much like experimental um because we're not really a narrative company so we're not really like a beginning middle and an end company we're much more about an atmosphere and an experience so we create an emotional scar um which is like a emotional kind of choreography of the emotions that an audience will go through because although we're working with political ideas we always want there to be an emotional feeling to those ideas so that it's not dry and it's not like you're just being told something but you're more having a kind of experience with it and then we'll find the site I mean obviously it's not all in order sometimes the site comes early or whatever but yeah so the site's really important like Rhiannon said because we know the site holds so much so we're always thinking okay what story are we telling and where is best to tell that story so and that could be symbolically or it could be the location so it's like actually um like for example we did a play about Muslim female boxers that has to be in a boxing gym but then with I Have Met the Enemy we were interested in working in areas where there's 
I well, but like near to where arms manufacturing happens and areas where there was high sign up and recruitment to the army. So like kind of areas that had like a local connection for people. So it's more about the area than the building. Um, but say we do a play about power, we do that in like a city hall or I don't know, just basically finding buildings that resonate with the piece. Um, and then from there, we pretty much more and more now, we're more interested in not working with actors and working or sometimes with a mix. Usually what's best is we work with a mix of actors and people who are completely new, but who's um, who are experts in the subject that we're looking at. So at the moment, we're working a new play um, about Islamophobia and car culture, because there's a very big car culture in Bradford. So we're working with drivers who've not necessarily had any acting experience, but they they're drivers so they're experts in being a driver and they and they also have a um very much a lived experience of islamophobia so it's like actually sometimes we're more interesting and you save a lot of time rather than having rehearsals where people are like trying to find their character people are basically playing a version of themselves um yeah and then we have a big tech period we're very much into tech like i've met the enemies you'll see in the trailer coming up had a lot of lasers and a lot of uh, light and sound and music so we really like to also give it a lot of framing and play a lot with um what music and light can do and then we get the audience in and it's always for us about getting working class audiences in so alongside all of that we're also always talking to people and connecting with people and getting yeah trying to build an audience of local people so yeah Wow, that's that's so inspiring. I'm sure lots of people in the audience are going to find that. That's, a, that's an incredible process. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask something about the emotional score. So, um, in fact, we also, in, with Besner, when we work, we're, we're, we we use that kind of that term, emotional score, instead of like a strict narrative score. And I was just wondering whether, when you're in the typical process, because as you said, processes are all different, but uh, the emotional score, is that genuinely informed by the research and the interviews that you do? So that's that's like the the background and then it comes, it, does it spring from that? Yeah, they go totally hand in hand. So like, for instance, with the player that Rhiannon was talking about, um, Our Glass House, which is about domestic abuse, we knew we wanted to explore the feelings of love for example, because we know that people stay with their partners out of love, not just out of fear and control. So we knew we had these big emotions like love, fear, control, expectation, bravery. That was the emotional scar for that play. So we kind of constructed the questions. But it kind of goes both ways. It's like you kind of construct the questions and say, okay, we're going to ask questions about love. And then from the questions and from the answers, someone might say something else, which is about control so then we're like okay now we're going to start asking questions about control <laughs> so we might go in there with a bit of an idea of like these are the big themes or the big emotions and then through the questions and answers we kind of are always refining the questions and kind of yeah pl- thinking actually okay what what emotion really is it like how do we go deeper than that so then we'd ask we kind of tweak the questions and then does this make sense? Basically, like, we we all have an idea of what the emotions are, but then also when we're talking to people and getting their answers, that helps us to kind of think about it in new ways and with new emotions. Um, but, yeah, no, the, the questions and, and the emotions are informing each other all the time and then shaping that score. Yeah, incredible. Um, I'll, on that, um, I've got another question. Sorry. Um, with, do you two often work very closely together on every project or is it more organic or does one write, one direct or like what's generally your creative um, partnership? Usually up until this year, we've always kind of co-directed everything and so that's a lot. I'm sure anyone who's in a co-directorship or a devised process know of like how many conversations that is. So you're constantly like, you know, you can have like an hour long conversation about one question that you should be asking in interviews or you know a whole day talking about one emotion and it's just like a lot of conversations so we're co-directing we'll often work with a writer but also that process is very much like kind of really interrogating and looking at what we're doing and as directors I suppose because we're not writing in a conventional way so we're kind of more creating structures and devising structures and devising the world and the environment um 
So yeah, but this year we're because we are based in Bradford and Cardiff. So actually, this year is the year when we're I'm working on Pisophobia up here with the drivers, and Rhiannon's working on a show called The Sea Is Mine uh, with Mums in uh, Cardiff and in Palestine. So we're basically now kind of like going our own journeys. Um, <laughs> But that's even more exciting. That's even more exciting in so many ways. And Rhiannon, if you don't mind, could I ask you a little bit about the project you're working on in Cardiff at the moment? Yeah, so um, it's very early, um, but basically um, the project is called The Sea Is Mine and it's our first uh, it's our first go of making a political children's show, uh, which is also for adults. So it's like, how do you make a kid's show that's for kids and for adults um, and we're working with a group of young mums aged 16 to 18 who are from the council estate that I grew up in. Um, I'm thinking of the process being with them and their kids so they work together to make the show uh, and the idea is that we co-create it with a group in Palestine with the same group of young mums that live there. Uh, it's based on um, visible and invisible borders so uh, in my 20s, I took a circus to Palestine and I met an old guy in he Al Halil in Hebron. Um, and he said, from here, you can see the sea, but you can't touch it. And this is Palestine. And in the council estate I grew up in, you can see the sea, but you can't touch it if you haven't got the money to get there. So it's kind of a look at, you know, the physical borders the man puts up and then also the invisible borders the man puts up and how we kind of overcome that and overcome our circumstances to reach a place of where we need to be. So it's about traveling beyond our circumstances. And the kind of, uh, the setting is a, is a library. So the library uh, in the estate is basically uh, being turned into something called a hub. So in Wales, the libraries have all been turned into like every central point you need in a community. So there's the police station in there, the community center, the library, the benefits office, everything is contained in one. And in the library, in this specific library the benefit office and the, the housing office is inside the library so if you're reading a book or if you go to get a book out you you often see people crying or you know having a really traumatic time because they're losing their benefits or they're losing their housing so basically I want to reclaim a kind of sacred space I want to reclaim what it means to have that space to escape and also reclaim it to be something different so we're going to stage the show in the library after hours for kids. It's going to be a massive treasure hunt where they look for the sea. We're going to meet the Palestinian women. So we'll see them on video a little bit like the enemy in our relationship with Shalda uh, and hopefully stage something similar in Palestine, but we haven't got that far yet. Um, but yeah, it's kind of massive. <laughs> um, and the idea is that it would be like a process on a production. So we're hoping that I mean, the big ambition, I don't even know if this is possible, is that we could move it to other parts of the UK so we could take it up to Bradford and maybe in Bradford we would collaborate with another group of young mums to make a play, a version that is about their own lives and then connect with somewhere else in the, in the world that might have physical borders, maybe somewhere like Kashmir and then create a relationship between Kashmir and Bradford and the young mums there. So it's kind of a bit of an international children's production reclaiming libraries of sacred spaces ambition <laughs> that sounds unbelievable that sounds unbelievable and like it sounds like a really exciting um project to start to create international solidarity as well because that's that's a really vital thing and we're always questioning at Besner as well like how can we create how can we how can we create connections and solidarity between people uh, that might not even know you know, they might not have any connection between those communities, etc. Because that's really in this 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 campaign that we're all after, this socialist campaign for uh, um, international equality. I think this is one of the essential steps, and without this international solidarity creation, I don't think it's going to be, ever be possible. So that's amazing. Yeah, and it's totally that. It's it's also this thing of like, I know the community that I'm working in so well, and I know that the young girls, they're like 16 to 18, they would have never have met probably people in Palestine or know the context of that. And I know that that relationship would be the most beautiful thing. And in the times we live in, like travel, like, you know, 
all the travel that we can't do <laughs> but all the connections we can make digitally like is that how do we how do we use the power of digital to really connect up and really understand each other's circumstances so we can fight together for what we need so that's kind of the mission within that I really hope you're going to keep me updated on that. That sounds unreal. Um, <laughs> um, I'd like to move on, if that's okay. Um, Rhiannon, would you be able to tell us a little bit about, um, we're about to move on to your next, we, one of your shows from last year, um, I Have Met the Enemy and the Enemy is Us. And so before we play the videos that we've got, um, would you be able to just introduce the project a little bit and give us a bit of context? Yeah, so Evie touched on it um, a fair bit. Um, so I've Met the Enemy and the Enemy is Us. It's about the UK's involvement with um, the arms trade. We're the second largest arms dealers in the world. Uh, and I guess like what me and Evie um, and the team wanted to interrogate is how we are so complicit but so unaware in our everyday lives and how can we kind of bring that back to us? How can we explore the people's lives who have been impacted on by the arms trade? Who can tell that story with us? And how can we show that, you know, there's there's this amazing website um, on the Campaign Against the Arms Trade web, website. There's an amazing feature where you can tap in your postcode and it shows you where the arms manufacturers are close to your house. And you do that in the UK and you find out that there's like, you know, in Cardiff, there's like six, I think, arms manufacturers really close to where I live. And then in Bristol, there's like hundreds, you know, like, and you just start to really build a picture of how complicit, how it's happening basically in our cities at the end of our streets and at what cost, you know, like what cost is that to people's lives? Um, so we started exploring in an R&D and um, we invited actors together and uh, in that first exploration, we met Momin, uh, who is one of the actors in the piece. And we realised very quickly that, we really wanted to work with people who have had a lived experience of their lives being impacted on in some way by the arms trade. So we um, we just decided that we wanted to find someone who had been a soldier in the British Army. And we met uh, an amazing guy called Alex Eli, who unfortunately can't be with us tonight because he's staying on it. He has to stay on at work. Um, but an incredible guy who served 10 years in Afghanistan who really wanted to talk about his experience in experience of PTSD and how his life was impacted. Um, and then through more development, we realised that we really have to bring it back into today, into now, into something current. Um, and we really couldn't, um, you know, we couldn't run away from the fact that Yemen was being so affected by the sale of arms um, to Saudi Arabia from the UK. So through a contact with Momin, we managed to find Shada, who is another actress in our play, uh, who lives in Yemen currently. So between the three of them, it quickly became an exploration into how do you really get to know each other? How do you get to understand this circumstance? How do we tell this story from the perspective of their own lives? So how do you bring the politics into it? How do you bring those conversations around, you know, the chair of um, BAE systems and what he does and how much he invests? That how do you make that something that the audience can actually um, digest? You know, which is quite a meaty subject <laughs> to, to approach. It's quite a hard one. But um, one of the the incredible things actually in the show and the, the thing that stay, will stay with me, I think, was the kind of um, the human spirit of it. So uh, when Alex and Momin, when we were in casting, it turned out that both of them were techno DJs uh, and they both lo loved techno. So there was this connection through music um, and the, the, for di different reasons, but reasons that absolutely binded them in this kind of relationship. So uh, for Alex, it was a way to express himself. Um, he would play to large crowds. For Momin, it was a way of connecting across the diaspora connecting with people in Gaza uh, and then finding Shada and understanding that she's an artist and she paints and she spends her time you know her spirit and her creativity was painting uh, through through living in Yemen and each each one of them was an artist and they were right in that time and also that spirit of creativity to get through things was really like palpable it was really like inspiring to have that in the show um, and shared that so in fact yeah I think that's kind of all I've got to say about it is it the, the video speaks for itself 
That's perfect. Thank you so much. And I think actually the human spirit and techno is a perfect lead into uh, what we're about to, the videos we're about to share with everybody now. Uh, so I think they're about to pop up just in a second. We've got a trailer and we've got um, a backstage kind of um, video about the process. Moment. Moment. Yeah, man. yeah, man. How are you feeling? I'm feeling great, man. How are you feeling? Okay, you really good. Techno for me is really personal. It's like my guardian angel. Enjoy me. I'm really glad you're saying this, man. I know what you mean. Techno does the same thing for me. Like, techno has connected me with all my Palestinian friends, especially those ones in the diaspora. Without this music, man, without techno, I would never ever have met any of them. So I know what you're feeling. Um, she couldn't understand that it was my choice to go to the war. I asked myself, do I want to go? Um, I said, yeah, yeah. I, I, I do want to go. Um, she couldn't really, she didn't like it. That was my career choice to go to the war, and some people they don't even have a choice to go to war. Um, they just have no choice at all. Hello everyone and welcome to the biggest arms fair in the universe. At 10 p.m. on Sunday, April 20. 2nd, 2018, a Saudi Arabian F-16 Typhoon airplane dropped a missile on a wedding celebration in al Raqqa village, Bani Ghais district, Yemen. I witnessed Fadl al Musabi. We were dancing happily like any other people who had weddings. It was a happy time and people were happy. The attack Man, yeah? Come, follow me, come. Okay, this is my friend Alex. Okay, okay and man. this is myself, Mu'min. Okay, we're gonna go and attack that point. You're gonna stand behind us and film everything. Make sure you stand behind us and stay safe, okay? I have met the enemies um, about looking at the UK arms trade and the UK's place within selling arms and weapons around the world. It's told from the perspective of a former British soldier who served in Afghanistan, a um, Palestinian actor and a Yemeni artist, and it's from all their different perspectives on what it means to be affected by the arms trade. Both of us being in a space, learning about each other, I think that's very personal. So this is, this is what the show about, basically, about me and Alex not knowing each other, but we consider each other as an enemy before we even meet. And then when we meet, we talk to each other, we find a, a lot of uh, things in common between each us. Both Matmin and Alex are techno DJs, so there's a very strong level of music and art and what, what it means to have a kind of cultural resistance. There's robotics, and there's lasers, it's quite a visual show, so it's very immersive, you're in it all the time, and it happens all around you, um, so yeah, it's quite an experience. When you come into the show, 
you are interactive audience member. So you'll be interactive with myself and Mormon and you'll be playing a part of the story. You will be a part of the story, basically. And it's really uh, about being inclusive as a group. It's not just I'm on stage as an actor and you're an audience member. We're all on this journey together. It makes sense because we can hear on the radio the town and say, oh, they're there, they're stood in it. For Commonwealth, it's really important for us to work right in the heart of communities and to take theatre right into spaces where people might not normally go. So going to Biker Community Centre and being in Bradford and Homewood Youth Centre being really, really important for us because it just places the stories right in the heart. It's personal, it's touching on, on our daily life and I believe the audience is going to walk out from this show also touching their own personal life. Okay, so now we are back. Um, so I have the honor of introducing um, Shada and Momin, who are also from the, the cast of um, I Have an Enemy. Uh, I've Met the Enemy. And um, I would like to ask, first of all, um, if you could just introduce yourselves um, for, for the audience. So can we start with you, Momin? Oh, you start with me. Okay. Um, uh, hello everyone, uh, my name is Motman and uh, I'm um, a Palestinian uh, based in London uh, who graduated from the Freedom Theatre, Jenin, um, under the method of Giuliano Merhamis, uh, who were assassinated in, in 2011 outside the doorstep of the Freedom Theatre. Um, Why well, I'm saying this because it's something really important in my life. Um, so, um, yeah, and I'm a theatre um, actor, writer, and um, and curator. I'm in Janine right now. Live from Janine. Thank you so much, Momin. And um, yeah. Shada, please. Hi. Um, I'm a visual artist. I live in Sana'a, Yemen. Uh, I start, I've started my artwork uh, since 2014, uh, after I got married uh, from the Biyan Saber Bamatraf. Uh, I have a lot of uh, art galleries in and outside Yemen. And also I have shared artwork with my husband. Actually, I studied IT, but uh, I do the art because I'm passionate about it. It's uh, uh, also uh, a way to express uh, the feelings that I have. That, that's it. Absolutely incredible. Thank you so much. It's such a wonderful experience to have you all here. Um, so I'd like to start off a question for you, Shada, if that's okay. Um, if I'm right, I, if, I, if I'm right, um, in your your role in um, um, I Have an Enemy, I've Met the Enemy, it was your first, uh, was your theatrical debut, no? Um, and I'd like to know like what it was like working on the show with Commonwealth and like generally what would you experience? How did you, how did you come across uh, Commonwealth? Um, uh, actually I was nominated by, uh, among uh, other female art, Yemeni artists uh, by Kumra Film, who is uh, uh, in a collaboration with uh, Commonwealth. So we were uh, through uh, uh, interviews and luckily I was chosen. And uh, may, uh, I might, I think that I maybe have been chosen because I have uh, uh, several experience and stories that are uh, related directly to the work, uh, especially to the UK arms trade. Uh, as you might know, uh, my house has been destroyed after I have uh, got an airstrike. Uh, that's, uh, yeah. Um, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry to hear that. Yeah, and uh, about uh, my first, um, uh, you know, as a, uh, this is the first time for me to uh, to be in a stage, uh, even in a screen for a pre-recorded scene, uh, because uh, uh, as a painter, I used to uh, to use the brush to express. So from the stage of that, I have met the enemy. It was uh, a turning point for me to to learn uh, different perspectives and uh, how to interpret my feelings and uh, uh, what I've been through uh, in a diff in totally different way. 
and uh, yeah, it was so cool. And uh, uh, especially when the workshops were like having two kinds of communication, and they were so open and kind, and uh, two ideas. And I was I felt really uh, involved in giving ideas and uh, thoughts. Yeah, it was very cool. Oh, that sounds unreal. Amazing. And can you tell me a little bit more about how it was working with um, those two forms of communication? Because obviously you were rehearsing and doing the workshops from a distance now. Uh, yes. Uh, you, uh, you know, because of the visa, it's very hard to travel. So we decided that uh, we can we cannot stop. Uh, we cannot stop to share ideas and experience through even through uh, online. So uh, the first days we started to uh, uh, scripting the scenarios and uh, uh, online and decided together how uh, we do it. So uh, after that, we uh, uh, we uh, filmed the scenes, the uh, match scenes and the um, uh, the other required scenes uh, in the in camera films. Uh, uh, yeah, and that's and we were sending them uh, the videos uh, 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 up to date. So the, if there is any uh, additions or any uh, mistakes, that we can uh, remake it uh, again before the big day. That sounds unreal. I love the moment in the in the video that we've just seen with this beautiful choreography of the screen with the video review on. It's incredible. It's like yeah, that's that's how you overcome borders physical and invisible borders with through theatre. That's really amazing. Uh, thank you so much, Shana. Um, so, um, Momin, could you tell me a little bit about how you came, uh, how you came to work with uh, Commonwealth and like, what was the experience like for you working on I Have Met the Enemy? Um, I joined the production from very early beginning of it. Um, actually, the process was quite a long one, like in terms of uh, like, based on my experience, based on my little small experience in theatre, this is like the longest uh, process of working on, 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 on theatre production. And uh, usually, you know, the classic theatre production goes off like two months rehearsal and then one month performances and, or two months or something like this. But this, this was quite like about two years, you know. So, um, so um, um, I, I, I give a, I, I phone call uh, Rihanna and I ask her about the, because they were looking for for um, for actor. It was not necessarily have to be like a Palestinian or, or whatsoever. It was just they were looking for actor, and and then I got in touch with Rihanna and uh, I I give I, I called her, and then she said uh, okay, well, drop me an email and and then um, so and then I did and then she invited me for the first R and D. Um, in chapter theater and and Cardiff, and then um, and then we spent one week in in and I, I think we we did like a whole show in that one week and um, and uh, with with other actor they were really nice and and but and then I I think the team um, um, Rihanna and Evie decided to do go with uh, with people who have a personal experience of or and personal effective. Uh, from the army trade, so and that was uh, that was sort of in my page because for me this is really interesting, you know. Like this is this is this is this is the company also I want to work with, you know. That that uh, that care about about personal experience of the performer itself, you know, and not imposing ideas from from uh, their own creative mind. Uh, which was uh, basically that that how I joined the whole production and then went on and on and on and on and all the way up to now. <laughs> uh, you mentioned in the video that uh, working on the show is a very personal experience, not just for you, but for pretty much everybody involved in the creation of that. Have you got anything else that you'd like to share with us regarding that? Like, was there a specific aspect of the content of the show that kind of drew you um, to, to wanting to really be there and have your voice heard and to be there? Working on the production of Commonwealth, I think I think their work not like their work is pretty unique because because they give you the space as a performer to 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 draw your own attention and your own life from your own life uh, experience, and and this is such a something I think we we deeply need in the creative industry. Uh, uh, especially in in the cinema, also in the in the screen, because the power of the screen is always hidden behind one man or one woman idea, 
but but uh, but uh, if we open up into a, in terms of sharing and 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 um, and combining or or, or like uh, going to an emotional journey to the performer itself, that will be another another side of it, you know. And we will see the the, the truth through it, you know. So this is for me is something I really I, I really uh, admire and and I really wanna wanna go for in the future and and and, and the coming productions. Um, I I do love the art for the sake of art, uh, but for me it's something you know maybe after you know like like maybe something for myself. But if you want to share and waste public time and public money, uh, I think you need to be asked to to uh, to uh, to create an ideas in order to change. And 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 because of that, you need to have. Um, um, you need to have like um, you need to you need to have like an impact on on those people who are performing, in order to have an impact on the audience. So um, so yeah, I do I do think like strongly believe that um, that that things should be personal uh, with with um, uh, when when it's come to the stage and 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 it should it should talk about something real. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and I think that's what I mean. From what I can, from what I've seen, from what I've read and heard, and everything, like I have met the enemy. It seems very much that it does that wonderful thing that I think that all political art should do, which is link the deeply personal to the the you know on the micro to the macro scale of the things like such as the global arms trade and how it's infecting each individual. And as um, Rhiannon and Evie were saying earlier, with the human spirit to be allowed to go through the play and to to, to lead the play. Um, it's a very interesting point you make actually with if you're using public money and public <laughs> funding then like it's a big question isn't it and it's something that we're always thinking about and always trying to promote that if you're using this money then the community has to benefit in some, yeah, in some absolutely. shape absolutely because it is for, yeah, yeah exactly um, before we move on I wanted to ask um, this question is both for you and uh, Rihanna and Evie um, so Mumi mentioned the, the a, a roughly like two year process of making this show could you tell us and share a little, little bit about that i'm really really curious because that is that sounds wonderful um i think yeah it was it was brilliant and we knew, i think we always knew when we were going to approach something like the arms trip that it needed time and it was going to be difficult and some things come very fast with theater and we knew with this we wanted to be really deep and we wanted to go far with it and we worked with um an incredible visual artist called Robbie Thompson who made 72 metronomes that were wireless devices to represent the 72 Eurofighter jets um, that were sold from the UK to Saudi Arabia and then used in Yemen. So we that was a big process as well, was finding out how what do these metronomes do, what can we do. So the whole way through the process, it was there was like lines going on of like, the people and the personal and the experience and then the technology that we were working with and the art and how we brought those together and then the politics and the research and trying to bring all of those together. We just knew, we kind of knew from the outset we didn't want to rush that and we wanted to give that time. Yeah, I think it's like, it's interrogation. It's like, how do you really interrogate the politics of it, which is massive, like huge, and, you know, how do you dig deeper, deeper, deeper every time? And then how do you interrogate the way to tell the story in a way that is it feels right as well? Because in the early days, like, we were interviewing um, friends and family about their connection with the arms trade. And, you know, it was, it was, I guess there was loads of incarnations of what the show could be and how that could fit. And, yeah, when we finally met the, the performers, we knew that that was the right journey that we had to go on, but we had to go on another journey to find the performers, you know, before we even got there. But I think um, I think theatre should be interrogating. Like, it should we, sh we should interrogate practice as well as politics, and it should take time. Um, yeah, because those things aren't flippant. Do you know what I mean? They have to have some depth to them. You can't just be like, you can't just rock up somewhere on a site and be like oh this fits because it's empty it's like how it like even the choice every choice is looked at in great detail with us i think i uh, like one of many things like um with 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 besner and i think we have a lot in common with commonwealth in this regard in regards to like 
when we make theatre, there isn't just a want. And you know, Momin was mentioning it as well earlier when he was when he answered the question. Like, it's always about a burning need to talk about something. That like, there is an urgency, and I think urgency is probably a reasonably well fitting word for the for, for this context. And I just that we've touched on it a little bit. I just want to to talk about if anybody else wants to mention any other like burning need because. I think more people are aware, maybe, um, of the impact of what war does abroad, but also like there's, there's always the connection, like what's happening in the UK, where the weapons are produced, and that this complicity, somebody mentioned complicity earlier, a complicity in allowing it to happen. Because what would happen if the factories weren't there? What would happen if workers suddenly refused to make those weapons? Like have that, that like has happened in the past. But so, um, so again, for Evie and, and Rhiannon, like, what was, for you, what was the inception? What was the starting point for, like, okay, we need to talk about the British Army? I think the, sorry, I'll, yeah, I think it was basically just being really clear that it was a UK story affects so many people, but it's really centred in the UK, and so often to say, oh, it's happening over there, but to bring it really local and bring it really home, to be like, this is happening here and we need to talk about this. And that was the urgency. And it still is. And obviously we know the way that the arms trade operates is in this very sick way where it's very invisible and it's very kind of stylized. So it makes it kind of like this glamorous thing. And actually being able to connect the dots and being able to connect what, what that means. Here it means economy. And then it's like, well, what does our economy mean around the world? But actually being able to really kind of centre that it's a, U it's a UK, the UK is the catalyst, is what I'd say. And also I would say like trying to challenge maybe some of society's beliefs around like very crassly, like who the enemy is, you know, like it's really easy to pit people against each other. But actually, you know, my, my brother and um, did some time in Afghanistan and he had loads of Afghani friends and would talk about um, swapping cans of Coke for Afghani weed, <laughs> you know, but like the, the kind of like, yeah, it's really easy to get people against each other, but what happens when you bring them together to have these conversations is a lot more commonality and similarity um, around experience and life and, you know, what's happening happening in the UK to our working class lads who get sent to the front line, that's still a question, you know, Alex's experience having Alex in, in in the show is a really incredible experience for all of us, I think. It was incredible meeting him in the casting. It was incredible seeing his and Roman's relationship develop. And and one of the moments that would stay will stay with me forever is like a moment where um Shadow and Alex were having a conversation around Alex's mum and what Alex's mum thought about the time he signed up to the army. You know, very personal kind of family relationships you know and we can all relate to that um but just feeling that connection across the world felt really really special like to challenge that and again we come back to that really really important point of creating international solidarity uh, and not just keeping it insular but also trying to expand out across all forms of, of violent borders um i think I think it, it also was uh, really important to, to raise awareness for the, the English community that, um, that the war is not far, you know, because they, 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 they you know, they, they convert the general conversation that going around and, and among young people in England that there's, um, there's a war, there's a war, you know, uh, and we are in a war with Afghanistan, but actually in the, uh, in the actual ground, they don't feel it in the, in the daily life because there is no... Um, uh, there is no impact on this, you know, but but this production is is absolutely ring the bell of of uh, of the audience who attend. That actually the the factory that make this weapon is around the corner. Yeah, so we are involved. So that was really interesting point to raise, and and also to see Alex, who's one of of the English community, uh, and and um, sharing his personal experience uh, on on what it feel to be in Afghanistan on a place that he have no idea what is it about you know and he doesn't speak the language of and and bring it back uh with him to to share it with his um with his community it was it was i think the audience left um with a lot of uh awareness and that's that was really important for me and not only solidarity because because solidarity sometimes you need to 
You need to ask before to stand on solidarity with somebody. Maybe this somebody doesn't need your solidarity, you know, maybe you need your, your understanding more, more than your solidarity. You know what I mean? So that was really interesting. Yeah, I'd like to talk a bit, a bit more about that. Like, what was it like for the for the all three of you? Unfortunately, Alex couldn't make it tonight, but um, maybe I'd love to hear um, both your uh, both your opinions, Shada and Momin, on like what it was like to work with um, the three of you together in the in the rehearsal room creating the show, where you may come from maybe different um, contexts, but also incredibly interlinked at the same time. That's I think that is a really fascinating and really important thing. So, can we start with you, Shada? Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, I started uh, the first date. We started to script uh, the scenario together. So, and uh, after that, we decided to uh, uh, focus on my house uh, before and after the airstrikes, and uh, how to engage uh, people or the audience to live the moment. So, by welcoming them to my house and inviting them to a cup of tea and playing uh, classical mu music of my house. And after we agreed on everything, uh, we start uh, filming uh, the scenarios uh, uh, on the Combra film. And um, uh, yeah, it was very challenging for me because um, uh, I have uh, my appearance will be in a pre-recorded scene. So I have to make sure that I have a, a, an eye of contact with the camera. And also um, count the seconds when I talk, count the seconds when I have to be silent and uh, react naturally. So, uh, yeah. And uh, unfortunately, I couldn't uh, see the feedback of the audience throughout the play. So I could only uh, see it through uh, Twitter and Instagram. But uh, I'm also grateful from the team. They were uh, uh, sending me uh, videos, small videos of the uh, audience cla clapping after uh, the play was finished. And uh, it was, it, uh, I was really happy because uh, I felt really, uh, when the people uh, felt I'm, I'm really part of the show, even if I'm not, re uh, I'm not really there, physically, I mean. I think even if you appeared in a different form, you were definitely present, I think. And I think Evie and Rhiannon and Norman would definitely agree. Um, Mum, would you like to add anything on, on, onto that with your, your experience, again, through the process working with Shada and um, Alex? It, it was like, um, uh, the whole process was a big learning process for me. Like, um, uh, I, 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 I never been in Yemen, uh, even though Yemen is just, across the Red Sea from here, like south from where I am now, you know, but because of the um, difficulty of the freedom of movement in the Middle East and, and, and Asia and, and, and North Africa, it, it makes it really difficult for me to make it to Yemen. But I did learn a lot from, uh, from um, you know, working with, Saj with uh, you know, like working on the production with, with the Comra team and the communication. It was really important to communicate um, and um, and then the, the next level was basically to me like to be on the same room with an ex soldier, uh, you know, like uh, who who served in Afghanistan and, and Yemen and uh, sorry and Iraq. Um, um, even though like as a Palestinian, I always put myself in a place that I have to defend everything. You know, I have to to defend myself. I have to to defend uh, my idea. I have to 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 explain myself a lot. To to uh, to people who I meet all the time in Europe uh, and and in the UK and America and 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 trying to change ideas about how they think of me, you know. But with Alex, it wasn't this way at all. It was like it was it was just uh, we, we we had to share like uh, the our 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 passion of of music, and that was and that was the the click, you know. And um, and I and I felt that for the first time in the stage. I don't have to explain myself, you know, and and uh, I just need to 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 talk about my personal uh, experience, and that was that was really a relief. It was it was a big relief for me as a as an actor on the stage who had experience to be on the stage before, uh, but this time it was it was like completely I don't have to explain anything about myself. So that was that was that was for me really interesting. 
And I get, thank you so much, both of you. Um, I think that comes back to an idea we discussed earlier. Uh, I think it was you, Rhiannon, that mentioned the idea that we have to interrogate and question practice as well as the content and the actual outcome of the show, the actual product. And I think this is, this is a thing that actually, I think, if we had to write a definition of like, I don't really like those, of political theatre, that I definitely think like practice is just as important as what actually comes out at the end of the stage on the stage at the end. Um, and I mean, I just think, yeah, it sounds really, really incredible. Um, so um, one thing I'd like to move on to another question, if that's okay. Um, basically, one thing that I really want us to interrogate a little bit more in this discussion before, before we finish is, is the research that you all discovered together. I'm not entirely sure if you were all together right at the beginning of the research or like people dropped in as uh, throughout the whole process, but basically like if we had to key ideas um, for br the British audience about what they should know about the British arms trade and um, its connection with basically British colonialism, which we've slow we've touched on a little bit already. Um, Rhiannon, would you like to start? That's a juicy question, isn't it? <laughs> Um, I guess that, like the thing, the thing that I find the most, like the, the thing that I was touching on earlier around campaign against the arms trade and that kind of understanding that arms are made in this country and they're made very close to us. Um, and it's very complex because actually, it's people, it's jobs for British people, you know. And there's an argument there around jobs and ethical jobs, and you know, there's all of that there. Um, I think uh, back 10, 10 years ago, um, an ex-boyfriend of mine was involved in setting up an arms factory in Brighton. It was, it was an arms factory called EDO. It, yeah, EDO, my EDO. And EDO was um, making uh, uh, release mechanisms to release uh, bombs from the F-16 that they were using in Gaza. And at the time, uh, a group of activists went into the arms factory and they smashed it up and caused a quarter of a million pounds worth of damage, which was an incredible action that basically, you know, was it closed down the factory. Uh, it went to court they were on a trial for three months. Um, it, you know, it was raised in, in na like nationally, it was raised as something. But the thing that I find most shocking and the thing that I find most impenetrable is that that factory didn't cease to make weapons, it continued to and does continue to make weapons. So even, you know, when we're doing these actions, like these massive direct actions that absolutely can stop everything, the power of the arms trade is continuous. Like it's really hard to stop the motion of it. It's like an impenetrable industry that is really, you know, we know what we know, but do we know enough, I don't know. Um, during our research, um, we met up with a campaign against the arms trade and we went to a trial that was being had with, um, it was a trial saying that Britain was illegally selling weapons to Saudi Arabia. You know, that was raised in in in, in the courts and the court said, yeah, that's happening. We're going we're gonna to hold off any sales, but they continue to sell weapons to Saudi Arabia that they continue to use in Yemen. So it's kind of like... I don't have any answers, but I know that the industry is this massive, crazy machine and there needs to be new ways to penetrate it and to, to rock it and to shift it. Um, yeah, that's my feelings about it. I don't know if that's even coherent, but something around those things for me. No, I think, I think it is very coherent and I think something to take away from that is definitely the idea of how terrifying and impenetrable it actually is as a as a global industry. Um, mm -hmm. It's, yeah. Um, Evie, would you like to let it add anything? Um, um, only like that we had this really great time with um, an artist called Jill Gibbons, who had been um, basically going in disguise into arms fairs for a long time and drawing the activity there. And what she talked about and then we incorporated into the play was this idea of like, that it's basically like an art show. It's like any kind of like fancy networking event where there's no money, there's no talk of money, but there's a lot of handshakes and performance of power. There's a lot of girls giving out canopies. It's this very kind of glamorous, glamorized, yeah, like I said before, like a kind of stylish industry. And you see that with the systems and the kind of way that they 
portray themselves. So there's, there's a lot in there around like the arms companies and how they sponsor certain events to make themselves look more appealing and how they're kind of the arts company the arms companies are in every kind of realm of public life um even like, I think, like there's, there's so many things that we kept finding out about where the arms um dealers are basically operating and how they kind of ingratiate themselves in public life and in personal life um and that was really interesting because that's the complicity as well that it's always there pensions there's so many things that the our investments and um yeah just our daily lives are kind of contributing in ways that we don't know the banks that we're banking with lots of different schemes and systems within the UK are feeding into the answer, bigger picture and we just you know don't know about or don't look to that and don't understand so I think that was yeah a big thing and then also just like to add to that is that I think it's worth saying that we're, we're not experts at the arms trade and actually part of the process is us learning about it as well and and that definitely is something that is I mean that, yeah it's so complex but like that whole kind of learning and kind of understanding unravels through the making of the show through the show and continues to unravel as we as we work on, don't work on the show do you know what I mean it's like a huge thing um yeah Again, this idea of the practice the, as a key part of the political theatre, like it's not again not just about what the show is at the end, but also the the process and the. I guess in some ways, I mean, I certainly with Besna, we've had many moments where we've had an idea, we wanted to explore something that we had this need, but then also there is this, the process of making the show politicises one and the, the entire team together, which you know I think is is. Is, is incredible. Um, Moment, did you want to add anything to um, the key aspects of the research, anything that you think would be really key for the, um, the audience listening tonight to know? Um, yeah, it, it was, it was a, like, absolutely was a self-emotional journey before, before it would be like, a, like a, a learning journey to myself, you know, it was, it was like going into myself and researching who I am really, you know, like, where I stand in, in all of this, you know, do I really want to be on the stage with an ex-British soldier? This is against my value as a Palestinian, you know, uh, do, do I really want to be um, uh, on the stage again and explain myself as a victim, you know, and so on and so on. So that was, that was like a really massive research and inner, inner research, you know, underneath um, the, the actual topic research or the team research, you know? So it, it was, it was like, um, so I managed to overcome uh, and agree with myself before before really like going ahead with being sharing like a personal story in, again and, and, and being careful that when I share this personal story that I'm not sharing for the fact of of of, of another um, another show where people are gonna go home feeling sorry about me you know. Uh, so we did manage with the help of uh, of Rhiannon and Evie, and, and we did manage to to sort of step away from from this uh, trap, you know. Um, and 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 the rest it was it was a very interesting research of of basically um, uh, to to see like to see what like how like 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 how many family in the UK, for example benefit actually uh, from from the the arm factory in newcastle and 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 bristol and cardiff you know and it, it was it was it was real you know it was real because because we we faces audiences who who related uh, in a in a way that to to um to these factories you know or they know somebody who benefits from those factories so that 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 brought the whole process to life you know and and um and yeah it, it was it was a lot of learning process it was it was learning of you know like working in a longer project in the first fall you know like it was you know discovery of of working in a, in a completely a new uh format of documentary theater it was a new to also working with uh, with somebody who never been on the stage uh and and you have to be on the stage with you know so it was it was it was all of this learning uh, and discovery and and meeting a lot of uh, community cast going to community places uh that that they not exposed to theater within the 
British community, even though we have the idea in Palestine that the British theatre is very unique and, 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 and have a deep culture, you know, but when you go to places around, around outside of London, and 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 you find out like oh okay well there's there's a lot of community to be reached out you know so it was it was all of this basically it was a lot of a lot of research and a lot of interesting things sorry the the shout of the prayer now you can't hear it <laughs> i really love what you said the moment about um the personal research like that you have to do because I think I think for everyone involved in the process of making the show, everyone from the stage managers to the lighting designer, everyone was reflecting yeah. on the entire time. And they're again the word complicity, like their complicity with um, with the making of the show, and their position and the country they live in, and you know all of that. It was constant like reflection. Yeah. And then and then in the. In the- in the big in the big image, like there's a small small production we did, which we where we have to shoot the scene with uh, with Sajda, you know, like in, in 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 Yemen, and 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 we have to do like a like a teamwork, really in a close the close the close um, details, you know, with uh, with the team of Comra Film, and that was also another research, like to how we shoot a, like a fiction within a documentary theater, like a completely experimental, but it's, it's real. I think that was one of our most historical days that day. It was in Evie's house and they were, um, we were filming the trailer for the show downstairs in the basement. That's and right. <laughs> we were like on the, on the um, computer to Comra Films, like talking about Shadow and like trying to get the pictures together and the video together. And we just kept swapping. It felt really like active. <laughs> Like Again, yeah. that's what I think. I think that should be, in, at least in my opinion, there should be that definite sensation mm-hmm. and that that kind of like um, feeling when you're making political theatre work. Again, like activism, you know, and that they there should there should be they should be definitely running in parallel and joining, if not entirely altogether. At least there should be correspondence between those two those two actions. Chada, I'd like to. It would be really interesting to hear your perspective on the research from the other way around, because we were looking at the research from the UK out, but from a Yemen perspective, did you find out anything during the making of the show from the other way around? Um, uh, To me as an individual, uh, six years of my life uh, have been wasted and uh, it's not easy to see my dreams and ambitions uh, are waiting or surrounded by boundaries. I mean, international or, or uh, so um, each year we uh, we suffer from different famine different tragedies and uh, raising uh, raise, uh, raising our groups uh, that are bargaining in our with our suffering so uh, uh, the uh, theater or a project is a smart tool uh, to shed light uh, the the life of the uh, effect 30 million people Yemeni are affected from this uh, uh, war in a, a very artistic and a creative way that uh, are, is uh, near to the audience hearts. Well, inc- yeah, that that is incredible. And I'd like, yeah, I mean, I remember when the lockdown started to happen also um, in the UK. Uh, when was that? Like March, April? May, sometime when um, Boris Johnson um, announced the the, the the quarantine, the lockdown will happen. In that same day, the UK also issued a huge, uh, renewed a huge um, arms contract and sold a lot more planes to um, Saudi Arabia and other places. And I just thought that that was a very jarring effect when masses of people were made unemployed, the country's being shut down for the vast majority, yet there's still a, always a priority. You know, and the priority is never the people, the priority is always... Maybe it's just profit. I always think it's it goes beyond profit. But yeah, I think I'm really glad to hear that, um, Shadow. You also believe that it can be an incredible tool to um, to um, to share and to um, activate and to um, and, and ignite, I guess, awareness. Um, on that point, because that actually brings me on to my last question for everybody. Um, on terms of like, if and this is to everybody, so you can just jump in whenever you've got something to say. But for those in the audience that are curious uh, about uh, making political theatre, um, 
what advice or what, not necessarily advice, but like any key points that you would say um, or share with everybody? Uh, because to me, in my mind, there's always a difference between political theatre and theatre about politics. Uh, you know, like chamber plays about what, you know, politicians are getting up to and stuff. And I don't really feel that that is actually, that doesn't really have necessarily a place in what we've been discussing tonight. I don't know whether you agree or not, but yeah, who would like to jump in for that question? I don't mind to go. Um, I think, I think for me, my advice would be like to think of the whole picture. That it's not just about the production or the play that you're making, but it's the layers that sit around it. So it's who's making it, it's where it's going to be, who are the audience, why are you doing it, why are you saying it now, like what, how can it be very complex in the kind of telling of the story, and how how can it be the most genuine story, like the most real element of it because I think it's really easy to build something from our own assumptions like to really think this is this is right but how do you bring in lots of versions of the story and lots of kind of dimensions of it to um really ask questions to the audience and to make them feel like that's why the emotional score is so important to us is like make people feel and connect on a human level bring the politics in through through that human connection and human sharing of what theatre is and what it can be. Thank you. Uh, does anybody else want to add anything to that? Um, I think uh, such a tour, uh, it's very important, uh, uh, especially for people who are living in the world uh, power countries like Britain. So at least they get the chance to, to know that their uh, in, international strat strategies are affecting the lives, the lives in the conflict. So um, I guess uh, people in Britain have normal life, uh, proper ed education, uh, uh, the health uh, care system is good, and at least they feel secure. And uh, um, they, they might know about the conflict in Yemen, but they, maybe they're not aware that their uh, their country is uh, has a rule in, in, in this conflict. So um, I, I believe that uh, maybe uh, the whole world maybe now understands how the the life in the uh, war torn countries like uh, like Yemen uh, after the during the last seven months uh, when the whole the whole world got affected from the COVID nineteen pandemic. So. All uh, airports are closed, and for food, uh, food uh, and certainty of jobs, and uh, even moving from city to cities uh, is became very difficult. So this is what, what we have been through since the last uh, six years in Yemen, and uh, uh, you cannot know how it is until you try it. So, uh, this is what I want to say, and so um, uh, I th I think I I. I'm sure uh, through this uh, project or theater and uh, uh, with the pandemics, uh, we can uh, finally uh, uh, convey a message uh, how the uh, and uh, how the lives of the affected uh, areas in the other part of the world. Absolutely, thank you so much. I, th th those very beautiful moving words, um, especially in a time when, as you said, in a pandemic where art is suffering hugely, especially in the UK. Theatre has gone through a horrendous um, situation and I hope that if only those that dish out the money uh, and the support um, could have heard what you said about um, the, the importance of, of, of theatre and like its potential role in helping um, ignite change. Um, Evie or Moment, did you have anything else to add? Any closing comments or anything you'd like to share? Um, in terms of advice, I'd just say, like, the most important thing is to really listen and listen to the people that you're working with and listen to the process and the things that happen, the accidents, or just, like, the connection that we had with Shadar, suddenly that gave us a whole new picture of what the place needed to be. So, like, like Rhiannon said, you can't go in thinking there's a fixed picture, like, this is what the play is, but to always be listening and evolving and responding to the people that you're meeting and the people that you're working with and knowing like actually it was really nice to hear you ventured out because actually it brings the 
urgency back of like why you're doing it, always knowing why you're doing it and what you're doing it for and that you have like a purpose. Um, I think that's really important and you just need to keep listening and absorbing that all the time. Um, so yeah, that's that would be my advice for theatre makers would be to listen and absorb and respond and take action, listen, absorb, respond, take action. You always have to have the action at the end of it, but you always have to be listening to so many things and influences. Yeah, I'm sure Matt Link can add more as well. I think, I think for me, it was um, um, uh, like uh, the safety, you know, like uh, making a political theatre, is it can be, um, it can like open an eye on you and on, on, on you as an individual or as a company, you know, and, and you need to be very aware of this. Uh, so um, uh, in the beginning, when I introduced myself, I mentioned Giuliano Merchamis who were assassinated and he didn't, he, did, he, he didn't get assassinated because because he want to get assassinated, he obviously get assassinated because he was a he was the lead of of the first community political theater to be open in the north of Palestine after the second intifada. Ah, you can hear it. Perfect. Hello. Yeah, sorry. I think that's somebody calling me, telling me not to say anything, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so basically, uh, he was assassinated because of his political work and because of the effect that he had managed to do in a small community in, in, inside inside the West Bank. You know, uh, until now, his um, his um, his uh, gunman, the one who shot him down, have not been found yet, and that's also give you a clear idea, like why, um, in, in the middle of the day, somebody will be killed. And until now, with two governments, we are under two governments here in the West Bank, politically. We are under the Palestinian BA, and we are under the Israeli uh, colonization. And those two governments, you know, have not opened a case yet, you know. So basically, uh, this is, this is for me, is really important. Uh, if you want to make a political theater and, and, and you, wanna, you are actually willing to stand uh, among the community and create a change inside the community, you need to be very aware and careful how to do that because because this is um, can motivate people in in many different ways. Thank you so much. I mean that that also brings back to a previous point you were saying, moment about um, the idea isn't to create sympathy, but we always talk about in business yeah. of like of, of 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 creating and uh, I think igniting empathy which is significantly different it's completely different the idea of empathy yeah. as opposed to sympathy um, and that that you can't create that without listening as Rihanna and Evie and um, Shada also said and also being just actually responding and never going in with the an end game and as an, an assumption um, I could go on for hours and unfortunately we have to stop um, uh, but I want to say thank you so much again for all of you joining us and, and taking the time. Um, it's been an absolute honor. And at least for me, it's been unbelievably empowering and inspiring to listen to all of you and your experiences. And I really wish that you continue making the incredible work you're all making and that we will see you on the front line. That was absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Good